Well, we're starting our sermon series on uh, the Sermon on the Mount this morning, and throughout the church age, since the day of Pentecost, we consider the church age, uh, there have been many great preachers. Matter of fact, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached a sermon, and 3,000 people came to Christ in that one service. I'm praying for a service like that someday. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I'd be happy with 300 myself, but uh, what a wonderful message that was. And, and all through the centuries since the time of Christ, there have been many uh, great preachers and, and great stories that we have of, of these great preachers from the past. And today, there are some wonderful preachers that are standing in their pulpits this morning in their local churches, and, and through uh, the communication systems we have with computers and televisions and, and uh, radios, broadcasting, even into places where they don't have high tech, there's a, a lot of the gospel of Jesus Christ being preached uh, around the world today uh, through some really great preachers. But on top of the pile... Above all the great pre preachers that we could mention, Jesus is the greatest preacher who ever preached. And here in these chapters of Matthew, chapter 5 through 7, we have the greatest sermon. So uh, if you looked at uh, the title of this sermon series and you said, wow, that preacher is getting full of pride, I wasn't talking about my preaching or my sermon. I'm talking about Jesus' sermon, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And this book is named after Matthew. We might just call him Matt. Uh, if he was living now, we would probably call him Matt. We have some Matts in the church. Um, but uh, his his given name, his uh, Hebrew name was Levi, but in this time when, uh, when Jesus was on the earth, it was under the Roman Empire, and they, they spoke Aramaic, and they wrote in, in Greek, and so the translation of his name Levi actually became Matthew, and he was um, laying out for us uh, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the life of Jesus Christ and, and what he had done. And in the early chapters prior to uh, chapter 5, where we're going to begin this morning, uh, we, we see the, the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew had a purpose. Each of the gospels had a purpose. And the, the, the purpose of uh, Matthew's gospel was to show to the Jews that Jesus was the fulfillment of the promise of the Messiah that he was the Savior that they had been looking for. So he began by tracing Jesus' lineage. And then we have his birth and just a quick run through his early years, not much about his childhood. And then we see that Jesus was baptized and then he was out in the wilderness and was tempted by Satan for a period of time. And then he launched his ministry. And early on in that ministry, he called a, a small band of disciples, that, and, and Matt was one of those. And uh, you, Matt was not the kind of guy that you would typically want to be one of the key leaders in your religious organization. He was a tax collector, and uh, tax collectors were just about as low as, well, I better not, well, I was going to say lawyers and politicians, but you didn't hear me say that. But they, they were way down here in, um, in, in as far as the social order uh, for a couple reasons. Number one, uh, here were all of these nations that were under the Roman uh, Empire, and they weren't collecting taxes for their own government. They were ta collecting taxes for Rome, and, and the people hated that they had to pay taxes. The other thing is, Rome only cared about getting their money, and so the tax collectors could add whatever they wanted, and so they would often cheat the people and, and charge three, four, ten times the amount that, that really was due, and they would send Rome the, the uh, required amount, and then they'd keep the rest. And so everybody really li disliked uh, tax collectors, and, and that's what Matt did for a living. He he was a tax collector, but Jesus invited him into the very uh, small band of disciples that would follow him. And as they went around, Jesus would teach and preach, and he performed miracles. P 
people were healed, and, and there were all kinds of miracles that were taking place, and so it didn't take long for the word to spread, and so other people were coming, and all over the region, people were bringing their uh, family members and their neighbors and anybody that had a disease or an injury or uh, were disabled in any way, they would bring them to Jesus, and he would heal them. And uh, so the great crowds became, began to come. And as we come into chapter 5, uh, well, before we get that, let me, just the description that Matt gives in uh, Matthew 4, 25, large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. And so these great crowds were coming and they were following Jesus. And when he saw them, he went up on a mountain uh, and he brought his disciples in around him, and he sat down. And these great crowds were then all around them. The disciples were right near him. And uh, it was very significant that uh, Jesus sat down, because this was the, uh, this, the position and the posture of authority. When the priests and, and others, would, the great teachers of the law, the Pharisees, when they would teach, they would sit down. It's kind of opposite of today. People kind of expect the preacher to be behind the pulpit and, and standing. Now, there's many that do sit down today, but it's not quite as accepted in our culture as what it was in his time. When you taught, you sat down, and it showed authority uh, to give the message. And Jesus began this sermon that actually covers three chapters in the Gospel of Matthew, and he began by answering the question that the title of our message indicates this morning, who wants to be blessed? Who wants to be, is there anybody here this morning that would like to be blessed? Put your hand up. You'd like to be blessed. Is it? I, I had both my hands up. I'd like a double blessing. We, we all want to be blessed. Who wants to be blessed? And they teach you in homiletics when you, when you begin a sermon, you have to start with a hook. You have to do, say something that gets people's attention so that they are interested in what else you have to say. And so Jesus is going to teach for three whole chapters, but he begins by answering the question, who would like to be blessed? And you know, there's many ways that you can be blessed. You can be blessed by words. In the Old Testament, you remember Isaac. His sons came to him, and they actually competed. Uh, Jacob and Esau uh, competed for the blessing that their father would give. And Jacob, although he was the youngest, he deceived his brother, and he deceived his father, and went in and received the blessing. And it was a, a blessing of words at, that, that were spoken. And, and our words can be a blessing uh, to other people, or other people's words can be a blessing to us. You can also be blessed by a touch. Uh, when Paul was writing to the young preacher, Timothy, he said that, that uh, there are gifts that you have, and you receive those when I laid my hands on you and prayed for you. There was a blessing that came with the laying on of Paul's hands to Timothy. And in James, James tells us that uh, if anyone is sick among us, to call on the elders of the church and have them come and anoint them with oil, to touch them with oil, to lay their hands upon them, and to pray for them, the, the, the power of touch. And even today, there have been scientific studies that have been done that people actually heal better when there's someone who comes and even holds their hand, even if they're not conscious. Just, just the, the human touch and the healing that it can bring to them. We can be blessed in other ways. We can be blessed by acceptance when, when we, we maybe are new, uh, new members this morning, and, and people feel accepted in, into the congregation. We can, we can be blessed by recognition when we've worked hard, when, we, when we've done uh, our very best. Uh, this morning, I think of Jim and Sally Frederick and their crew that do such a great job with uh, our landscaping and all the flowers, and the weeds don't stand a chance with them around in those flower beds. They are out here in the hot sun. Anybody know it's been hot lately? I can't tell you how many times I've seen them out there on their hands and knees digging weeds. Uh, and, and so, you know, when you're recognized, uh, that can be a blessing. Or when, when you're appreciated, those things can all be blessings. But all of those that we've mentioned, words, touch, recognition, acceptance, and all of those things are dependent on others to bless us. Okay, so, you know, any human being can be blessed 
in that way. But Jesus is telling us how we can be blessed directly by God. And we see that in the, in the way that these sentences were, were written. Uh, uh, one of the things, in, especially in, in the Gospels, but also in, in other writing, when people talked about God and what God was going to do, God's name was so sacred. They didn't like to use his name uh, and, and, and specifically even verbalize his name or write his name. And so they would do things to indicate that it's God without it being God. And one of them was to use the passive tense. And uh, so when it, when it says that you will be, rather than saying God will do this, he, you will be blessed in, in one way or another. It's an indication that it is God who is doing the blessing. And so what we're looking at this morning, we call them the Beatitudes, are, are, are eight ways to be blessed by God. That's what, what we're looking at. And the first thing that we want to notice is blessing to the poor in spirit. Blessing to the poor in, in spirit. In, in Matthew 5, 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When, when we come before God and we recognize our poverty of righteousness, when we, when we recognize that He is holy and we are not, and we come before God and, and we confess our sin and we repent of our sin and turn away from our sin, there's a promise for God to bless us. And uh, in Luke chapter 18, we have Jesus giving a story of two men who went to pray. Luke chapter 18, verses 10 to 14, that illustrates what we're talking about here. A Pharisee went to the temple to pray. And when he goes in to pray, he begins to brag I am so thankful that I'm not like other people, murderers and liars and, and deceivers and, and tax collectors and, and adulterers. But then there was another man who was a tax collector who came over and he was, he was standing afar off. He wouldn't even come in where this Pharisee was. And he stood off on the side and he prayed, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said the tax collector, rather than the Pharisee, went home justified before God. When we dare, even as long-term Christians, and, 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 and we begin to think about our spiritual maturity and all the things that we don't do that other people do, and uh, maybe some things that you do that others don't do, and we begin to tell God how good we are, we're not going to get a blessing. It's the poor in spirit. When we come before Him and we confess our sin and we repent of our sin, then we receive the blessing, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who humble themselves before God will experience the kingdom that Jesus is establishing. And, and, and that's the starting point. That's the where you begin. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, and uh, you're here today and, and you're saying, man, I like this idea, I want to be blessed. The first place to begin to be blessed by God is to confess that you are a sinner like all other human beings born in this world and repent. That means to turn around or change your mind or go in a new direction, turn away from your sin, turn to Jesus and seek Him to be your Savior. And instead of following Satan and yourself, begin to follow Jesus. That's the starting point to blessing uh, from God. The second thing that we want to notice quickly is blessed to those who mourn. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. When you mourn the loss of a loved one, you know, the, the presence and the words and the touch of, of, of others bring healing to us, and it means so much to us. The day of a funeral is so vital, and not only the service, but but the visitation time prior, and, and if there's a luncheon after and, and the fellowship, it's, it's that sharing of compassion and sympathy and condolences, and maybe even you know, at the lunchtime, remembering stories and how this person blessed your life, and maybe even some laughter. That begins the healing process for people who are going through times of, of uh, bereavement. But others cannot fill the void in your life, and human comfort will always disappoint you. You know, if you're, waiting, if you're waiting back and you're saying, well, 
People are going to come and they're going to take the place of my spouse or my child or my parent or whoever passed away. You're going to be disappointed. Human beings can't do that. And it's not very long before other people are going back and being involved in their lives and you're still going home to that empty house. Or you're still seeing that bed where that child used to sleep and that empty spot at the table that that family member had and you're carrying your burden. Human mourning and human comfort is not going to fill the void in your life. But, but Jesus said, if you turn to God in your mourning, that you will be blessed. You see, and what will you be blessed with? You will be blessed with the comfort that only He can provide. He, he can heal you from the inside. But I, I believe there's another kind of mourning that this may indicate as well. And it, I, I felt kind of compelled at this point in human history to kind of share this from this perspective because we see it happening so much in, a, in our world. When you mourn because of an offense, and everyone faces offenses in your life. If you're past three years old, and uh, you haven't been offended by somebody, uh, you're fortunate. You'll never make it to your fourth birthday without being offended, I am sure. We all have our stories about our offense, and, and, and we're tempted to share our offense with others, and, and we're sure to share it from our own perspective, not from another person's uh, perspective. And we see it so much today, even in turning into violence, the, the shootings that we see. There, there, there's a person who is shot in Mississippi or Louisiana, uh, I think it was Mississippi, and another one shot in Minnesota, so somebody's offended by that, and they go and shoot 12 police officers in Dallas. That's not the way Christians respond to their offense. You see, we, 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 do, we are not to, to, to respond in that kind of, of, of anger, and, and we see it on road rage today. Somebody cuts you off in traffic or somebody, you know, d doesn't do something the way you'd like. Maybe they're driving too slow or they're driving too fast. And the next thing you know, people are driving by and shooting one another because they don't like somebody else's driving. There would be a lot of dead people in the Lehigh Valley if we would practice that. You know, that's just, you, you, that, when, when you are offended, you are mourning for yourself because of your offense but we need to take our mourning to God. And the blessing is they shall be comforted. Maybe nobody else understands your perspective. Nobody else understands where you're coming from. But you take it to God and you will be comforted by him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, I use this often at the graveside of, of uh, services at funerals and graveside services. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. The third thing that we want to notice is the, a blessing to the meek. Blessing to the meek. In Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And you might say, well, I'm not meek. I have an outgoing personality. I'm boisterous. I'm not meek. Well, that is, that's a misunderstanding of what Jesus is talking here about being meek. Meek means to be teachable. And, and Jesus is saying, blessed are those who um, uh, are a person who learns to trust God. When you're learning, you see, the, the first blessing comes to people maybe that are just getting started or maybe have allowed pride to come in their lives after being a Christian for a long time, and, and blessed are those who are poor in spirit. But now he's talking to people who have been down the path for a while and have learned to trust God. I, we need to learn to trust God with our nation right now. In, in, in this time of turmoil and everybody has an opinion and, and everybody expresses their opinion and, and quite frankly, there aren't a whole lot of good options out there anyway. But uh, we, we do that. But we need to learn to trust in God. We need to tr learn to trust in God as a church. We need to learn to trust in, in God in our own personal lives. That God will take care of things. We can't figure everything out. We can't 
put all the information in a computer and come out with an answer. We can't sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil and add it all up. Sometimes we just have to trust God. And when we have learned to trust God, Jesus says there is a blessing that will come your way. You will inherit the earth. You will find out that when you've come to the end of your rope and all that you have left are the promises of God, God will fulfill his promises in your life. And so when, blessed are those who discover how to trust in God or blessed are the meek. The fourth thing that we notice then are blessing to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now, have you ever seen a person who is really, really, really hungry? We probably haven't seen them much in this country, although there are some hungry people in this country, when you see the hunger in other parts of the world, it pales. I, I remember a few summers ago, I was driving to a hospital visit, and I had the top down on, on my uh, convertible, and there was a man at a traffic light who said, feed me, I'm hungry. And so I was stopped at the light, and of course, there's no, there's no shield there when, when you have... Uh, uh, a convertible with the top down. So he just walked over and started telling me, you know, about his hunger. And I said, okay, right over there is a, a uh, Wendy's. I'll go over there and get you a hamburger. And he said, oh, my doctor doesn't want me to eat hamburgers. And uh, so then I said, well, I'll get you a salad. I said, they have some good salads over there. I drove over, got it, went through the drive through window, came back. And by the time I got back there, he was gone. I had a real nice salad for lunch that, that day. But just... You know, in America, we have really, very few people are really, really hungry. Another time, in, I believe it was back in 2005, I was on a mission trip to uh, Costa Rica. And uh, we were there to, to do some building work and everything. And, of course, I have no skills, but I was helping to carry stuff and all that sort of thing. But one day, in the middle of the week, we took off from the manual labor where we were in building these buildings. And uh, one of the people that lived there and was kind of the leader of the project, uh, on that day, every Wednesday, he would just take that day off. And he went back to the streets uh, of, of the uh, city, San Jose, where he was raised, and uh, they would go out and they would distribute food. But there were so many people that he had to get to that he had three-week schedules. He'd take, he'd take Route 1 uh, for the first week, Route 2 the second week, and Route 3 the next week, and then on the fourth week, he'd go back and do the first week again, uh, route again. And people literally had to scrounge for food between the times that he would come. And what they were being served was just a little bit of pasta noodles, looked like spaghetti, and a little bit of lettuce with some carrots in it, and uh, they'd get a, a little Dixie cup, and they'd get like a little quarter of a cup, and if a mother came and had her children with her, they'd get about three quarters of a cup, and that's what they were getting, and knew not where they would get food for the next three weeks until this man came back again. Now, those people were hungry, and they would stand in line waiting to be served that little bit of food because they were hungry. When we get hungry, like people are hungry in this world, and when we get thirsty, like people are thirsty in this world, and we have that kind of need and that kind of desire for righteousness, Jesus said, you will be filled. And what will you be filled with? You will be filled with righteousness. There are some people who say, oh, we're human beings and, you know, we, we have to sin. Matter of fact, we sin every day and, and we've come to accept that. Oh, well, we, we just sin every day. And, and, and we accept sin as being normal and, and, and being the acceptable way that, li that we can live. But Jesus said, if you want the blessing of God, you don't live that way. You, you might recognize, hey, I am not perfect, and, and I live in a fallen world, and we're all susceptible to sin. But when we get tired of our sin business and, and, and the patterns of sin in our lives, and we really, really get hungry for righteousness, and we really, really get thirsty, thirsty for righteousness, Jesus said, you can receive a blessing that God will fill you with righteousness. That's why I couldn't preach this sermon this morning when I misguided people in my answer about a stupid little thing like 
being tired at Dorney Park because it wasn't true. It wasn't right. I did get tired, and it, it, was, it wasn't true. And so we need to not just excuse our sin and expect our sin and pass by our sin, but we need to come before God and confess our sin and come before Him with, with hunger and thirst for righteousness just like people on this earth are hungry and thirsty when they're dying of, of starvation. And if you've ever clapped in this service, in, the, in this church, you ought to be clapping this morning. That's the truth there. And the blessing that you will receive is to be filled with righteousness. In Romans chapter 6, verses 12 to 13, it says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to Him as instruments of righteousness. If you are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, God is not going to turn His back on you. He will bless you by filling you with righteousness. The fifth thing that we want to notice is blessing for the merciful. In uh, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Mercy includes the ideas of both compassion and forgiveness. And the blessing that they will be shown is the promised blessing to the merciful is mercy from God. Compassion and forgiveness from God. Later on in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to say, matter of fact, that if you don't forgive others their sins, then your sins will not be forgiven. If you want compassion and forgiveness from God, then you have to offer forgiveness to others. The sixth a blessing that we're going to look at, sixth way to be blessed by God, is the blessing for the pure in heart. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. To describe purity as a matter of the heart means that it deals with the intention or will of the person. This can work either way. Sometimes we look at other people and, and we see what they do and the way they do it, and they say, wow, that person really loves God. Look what they're doing. But in their heart, they're not doing it because they love God. They're doing it because they want people, they want human applause. They, they want people to tell them how wonderful they are. They, they don't have pure motives. And then there's other times that people really want to please God. They give their very best effort, but it's not all that great. And people say, wow, that person isn't very much of a Christian. They're not very good, uh, they, uh, but yet they have a pure heart. And, uh, and, and so this is what this is talking about. The pure in heart are those whose intentions are, and their motives are unmixed. It's not about performance. It's about the inner heart and the intent and the motives in what they are doing. And the blessing is that they will see God. And in Exodus chapter 33, verse 11, talking about Moses, it says, The Lord will, would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Moses was so close to God that he was able to talk to God like a friend. That's what this whole idea of seeing God is. It's not some time out there in the future when human history is over and we're in heaven, but to see God in the intimacy of a relationship with Him in the here and the now. The seventh thing is blessing for the peacemakers. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 9 it says, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the sons of God. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom and it means total well-being rather than the absence of conflict. We think if, if nobody's mad at us, we've had, we have peace. But that wasn't the, the meaning of peace in the Hebrew language. It, it was more than just the absence of conflict. It was total well-being of others. And this beatitude blesses those who do the work of bringing well-being or good in the lives of others. Sometimes that's even that personal sacrifice, giving up something of yourself to make it good for somebody else. 
that is a peacemaker who, who's trying to bring good things into the lives of others. And they will be called the sons of God. People who, for, for the good and well-being of others, God will call his sons and daughters. What a blessing. I mean, the, the Nobel Peace Prize is nothing to that. Getting recognized at our district conference for being the servant of the year is nothing in comparison to that. When God puts his approval on us and calls us his sons and daughters, now that is a blessing. And then the eighth and the final that we get to, and that's a blessing in itself, isn't it? We're getting to the eighth and final one. Blessing for the persecuted because of righteousness. If, if you have lived in America all your life, and I have, we don't know anything about persecuted. We think if somebody doesn't say Merry Christmas in a store that we would be being persecuted. Or if, you know, if, if somehow they, they don't salute the flag right at school, uh, that it's a, that's persecuted. No, that, that is, they're, they're in conflict with our Christianity, but that's not persecution. Persecution is drawing blood and taking life and property and, and all of those things. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 to 12, it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For the same, in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The apostle Peter, who would have been there on this day when Jesus was giving these, said it in a different way as he wrote to persecuted people that had been scattered all through their area. He wrote these words in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. And then down in verse 19 of 1 Peter chapter 4, so then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. These are the words of Peter to, pe to people who were actually being persecuted, had been driven from their homes, driven from their cities, beaten. Some of their, their family members and friends had been killed, and he's writing to them in this way. Those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. No matter what the persecution is, we continue to serve God. And the blessing for doing that is, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. You are identified with the persecution of the prophets. Now, the persecution itself is not good news. To, to be driven from your home, to be driven from your city, to, to be denied by your family, to, to be beaten and imprisoned and to know family members that are close to you who have lost their lives, that's not a blessing. Not, not for Christians, not for anybody. That's not a blessing. But what is a blessing is to be identified with both the ministry and the fate of the prophets. That is good news because great is your reward in heaven. There is no sacrifice that you will ever make in this world that will compare to the reward that God has prepared for us in heaven. And there's some things that we just have to wait to receive. Some people in our world today have lived their whole lives under persecution because of their faith. But there's a day coming when they stand in the presence of God and they will receive their reward. Richard Buse wrote in Decision Magazine, many think of heaven as a vague, transcendent existence, but not with God. Heaven is God's home. Everything in heaven revolves around him and the throne that he occupies with Christ, his son. Heaven is more real than the earth that we dwell on, and we will be in his presence forever and ever and ever.
But I want to remind you this morning, in case you haven't started on this path yet, if you haven't yet begun to receive the blessings of God, and you haven't begun to follow Jesus yet, I just want to remind you, it all begins with the poor in spirit. It begins with a spirit of confession and repentance. I'm a sinner. I confess that. I confess that I've committed acts of sin, but I right here today turn from that. I turn from my sin. I turn from my rebellion against God, and I turn. I repent. I turn to God. I ask Jesus to forgive my sin, and I choose to follow Him. And I trust if there's anyone here this morning who has not begun the path of receiving God's blessing, that you begin that path today. And I trust that there are Christians here today all along at different stops in that path that you have been encouraged and that there's hope for you in areas where you've struggled, in areas where you feel defeated, that if you want the blessing of God, Jesus has given you eight ways to receive that blessing. I didn't give them to you. He had them right there in, in the Word all the time. If you need God's blessing, then put yourself under His rule and be the person that He would have you to be and His blessings are assured. Let's bow our heads for prayer. And in my closing prayer this morning, I'm going to pray a prayer of confession and repentance. And if you're here this morning and you want to begin this path of blessing from God and in this path of following Jesus, I'd encourage you to pray this prayer with me this morning and ask Jesus to be your Savior. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your love for us. We thank you, dear Lord, right from the very beginning, the the very first recorded words of Jesus in Scripture begin by telling us how we can be blessed by God. Sometimes we're blessed by others, and sometimes we're not. Sometimes the blessing that we receive in human ways, although we mean well, do not go deep enough to really solve our problems. There's nothing that we can say to a widow or widower at a graveside that will ever bring the love of their lives back. We just humanly can't do it. But Lord, you can fill the void that's there. And all of these blessings that only you can give. And when we suffer, when we're offended, Whatever it may come our way, help us to remember that it's in our suffering that we become open to the blessings of God. Lord, if there's anyone here today who has not begun down that pathway of blessing, have not yet come to know Christ as Savior, I pray that they will pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I confess my sin to you. I confess my acts of sin to you as well as my, my rebellious spirit within me. And I turn, I repent, I change my mind. I go in a new direction. Instead of fulfilling my sinful nature, I turn to you and ask you, dear Jesus, through the power of your blood that was shed on Calvary to forgive my sin and to help me to become a follower of yours. May you help me to follow you each day for your glory. And Lord, help us all to honor you in our lives. May you bless each one, Lord, who has prayed that prayer. And may they begin this pathway of following Jesus. And Lord, may each of us, in the places that we struggle, go back to these words of Jesus and find that even the toughest places in our lives are doors of opportunity to the blessings that God wants to give to us. Send us forth to be your people. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.